This episode is sponsored by Kendo UI. Kendo UI allows you to build better apps faster. They have a comprehensive library ranging from data grids and charts to buttons and sliders. Plus, you can use their components as plain JavaScript as well as in Angular, React, and Vue. They have a large collection of customizable popular themes like Bootstrap and Material. Go check them out at javascriptjabber.com slash kendo UI. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Views on View. I almost said Adventures in Angular. How's that? This week on our panel, we have Eric Hanchett. Hello, hello. Chris Fritz. Hi. Uh, we have a new panelist, and that's Divya Sasidharan. Yep, that's right. Uh, do you want to just give a brief intro before we get to our guest? Yeah, sure. So I'm a developer, and I work at a small startup in Chicago, where I work on View most of the time. Very cool. And you were recommended to us by Chris, so... Thanks for looking out for us, Chris. She, she's, she's pretty awesome. I'm really happy to have her here. Awesome. Yay. And then I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. I've got a lot of irons in the fire, but yeah, I just want to briefly call out, I'm putting up an Alexa skill for JavaScript rants. So if you're looking nice. for JavaScript content, I'm also going to be putting it on the Amazon Echo as a flash briefing. So you can get it there and it'll be on YouTube. So if you're looking for like really short, just talking briefly about some aspect of JavaScript or some article online. That's what I'm working on these days. Uh, we have a special guest this week, and it's Philippa Lacerda. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself really quickly? Yeah, so I'm a senior front end engineer at Kipla, um, and I work with you uh, every single day. Awesome. And we brought you on today to talk about building a model component with Vue. Yes, uh, it was a, an article that I wrote. I don't think it was that long ago. Um, but mostly I was focused about on uh, creating a reusable component. Cool. Now, reusable meaning something that you can put into your application in multiple places or share yes. across multiple applications or both? Well, the, the main idea was to uh, use multiple times in your application without having to worry about writing new code every time. Gotcha. Now, is that terribly different from just writing a component in view? Yeah, what makes a component reusable? <laughs> well, I guess you can say all, all components can be, re, can be reusable. Uh, but I think my main focus is trying to create something uh, that I don't have to worry about. I just know that it will render um, a new UI that I'm expecting. I just need uh, to provide some 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 props, maybe maybe use some slots, and I don't have to write new code when writing a new feature. So, and what are some things that you see people do wrong in components that that make them not something that they don't have to worry about? <laughs> That's a tricky question. <laughs> well, when we get to I don't know, it happens often when we're building new features. When we specify too much, maybe um, it's probably we are not doing it. We are not doing it right. I think if if you if you want to not worry about too much with your reusable components, maybe try to make them as simple as possible. Don't try to just with one component um, reuse them in a lot of situations. So if it's a button, mm -hmm. it should only be a button. Don't try to make it also uh, an item inside a list or a button inside a table. Just render a button. So, so don't try to make it do absolutely everything. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so don't try to make your button just like anything that might be clickable. <laughs> I don't know. I, I kind of want to build the Swiss Army component. <laughs> I only have one component in my apps. That's all I need. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. Once, use everywhere. <laughs> so one thing that I wonder about a little bit with this is how much of the job of writing a reusable component is the code? How much is maybe the tests? And how much is collaborating with your team to make sure that it's something everybody can use? Well, I think the last point is, is the most important one because it's very hard for one developer to miss something. So uh, if you discuss with your team uh, what are the needs of the components, uh, you may, uh, you, you'll probably create a better component that fits all needs. Uh, because it's, it's, especially if you're working in a very big application, it's very easy to miss. Um, and I think that should be the step that takes the longest. 
uh, and planning it. Um, it's it's. I think it's the second most important step is to plan properly the components, all the props that we'll need, and even if you want to use slots or properties or any other thing, you need to just plan it first. I think tests is probably the thing that takes um, that takes long bef- uh, regarding writing the component itself. Uh, yeah, writing tests usually takes a little bit longer. Um, but I would say in this order. What do you think about, uh, I know you wrote up some articles about accessibility and, what, and you uh, talked about adding that in. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, I've, I've, I've always um, tried to write reusable, um, sorry, accessible um, components. And it's, sometimes it's very, very hard, um, I think. Most of the times your HTML, it just if your HTML is semantic enough, uh, you should you shouldn't need all these all these labels. Uh, but in in some cases you do. Uh, although it's very very hard, um, I think it's important, especially if you try to not even just for accessibility, just try to navigate with your keyboard. Um, if you're a power user and use a product every day, it's very important that you can use it through your keyboard. Uh, but also. Um, to think about people that don't have the same um, the same skills that we can can have while navigating, like, like as a programmer, but also people that uh, don't have. There's people that can see they use the internet as well, so we need to think about everyone. So you you in your planning, you make sure that's a part of every component that you create that you can at least keep that in mind. Well, in my daily job, not so much, unfortunately. <laughs> Everything moves too fast. Uh, and sometimes that step is missed. If you're starting to think about building uh, accessibly in Vue, specifically for v- reusable Vue components, like what are certain steps that you would recommend starting with, especially if you have like no background in developing accessible components? Like what are some things to think through? And maybe define it for people who don't know. I guess we kind of went over a little bit, but I don't know if that... Yeah, that's a great access. idea. Well, uh, I think the first thing I did, uh, I, I, I rely on MDN a lot uh, to, learn, to learn stuff. So um, the first thing I did was I, I just read through their um, area section. Um, I think it's actually very accessible because if you look to the specification of area, it might be a little bit confusing, especially if you are starting. Uh, there's a lot of specification and it's hard to follow every, every chapter. So I would start... Um, by MDN uh, documentation. And then also as you, like you were mentioning a little bit about testing and how difficult that process is. Um, like specifically for if we want to build something accessibly, how, how do you test for that? Do you like, do you have a process around doing that kind of testing? No, I don't think I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, yeah I think- as I mentioned, oh, sorry, but as I mentioned in my daily job, we don't. Um, well, although we try to make to make it accessible, it's something we we don't do often. So it's something that I don't have much experience uh, doing. Yeah, I think when I've done accessibility stuff, I have always struggled to find like a good way of testing it. Besides doing just manual QA of like using your keyboard to tab through or using voiceover to make sure that like. Uh, someone who is blind or someone who has a disability can at least use the application, but it's it's t- it's tough. Even even manually, uh, at least I found that when I was writing um, how to create uh, an accessible auto component. So if I tested with Chrome and VoiceOver, the output wouldn't be the same uh, if I test with Safari and VoiceOver. So even manual test is very very hard. Yeah, that's a good point. Is that we've kind of veered from reusable to accessible, which I, I think is a, is an interesting topic, and and I love digging into this. So I'm I'm just going to keep going down this rabbit hole. But I'm curious: are are there types of accessibility that aren't handled by area? I mean, there are so many people with so many varied disabilities as far as how they can use the computer, and so I wonder if if it covers the majority of the cases, or you know, if if it falls apart for certain people. That is a very good question. <laughs> I have to confess, I have no idea. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure either. <laughs> I think um, 
That's like that's actually a good question too because uh, I think on Twitter I saw someone post maybe it was like someone in the React community post about how because um, you know there are certain apps that have seizure risk like if there's blinking screens or colors but there's like no true way of really testing for that uh, at the moment not that I know of at least so there's a lot of like edge cases that I know are not taken care of but um, Marcy Sutton. I think is her name. Mm, she she, is, so good. she is great. And um, she tweets regularly about uh, resources specifically for like making sure that your app and your applications are accessible. So I think like it's worth a follow and like seeing what she has talked about. Well, the other thing, especially with the, the um, seizure prone folks is you find that there's a spectrum on almost all of these things. And so it'll affect one person different from another even if they tend to have the same type of disability. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's re, it really gets nuanced when you dig into it. Yeah, and I suppose there are, there are things that you can't handle by adding like ARIA attributes or something like that in the sense that if there are people who are very distracted by a lot of like animation going on in the screen, like you can't add an ARIA attribute to make them not distracted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, but like th this is something that Rachel Neighbors talked about uh, at ViewConf, mm -hmm. actually when she when she gave a really really good talk that is out now. I recommend people check it out. And she talked about doing transitions and animations in Vue, and also at the end she talked about removing the or, or like having a toggle for animation. Yeah, I think that your, was an iOS in your application. Feature. No, she she, oh, was she, it? she yeah. showed how to do it generically as well. Oh, okay. Uh, which I thought was really interesting. And it, before, like, before I was talking with her about it, that was something I had never actually considered. Like having a toggle for animation on your on your app that that sounds like a great idea. As someone who is often distracted by animation, <laughs> and of course, if you're if you have a lot of like flashing lights on your site or something like that, then you could give someone a seizure. Mm -hmm. No ARIO attribute is going to help you there. <laughs> <laughs> Display hidden, just everything. It also occurs to me, especially since I'm not a disabled person, or at least if I have disabilities, they're, they're not the kinds of things that people diagnose in people or anything like that, you know, and it doesn't impair my ability to use a computer. And I think I just implied that I might have a disability and I don't, I really don't. <laughs> And I just want to clarify that. But that that's kind of the point at the same time is, you know, how how do you refine this as you go along, both for reusability and for accessibility, as far as you're using it and then somebody else comes in and they start using it and you realize, oh, it, it needs to be tweaked along these lines. You know, how, how does that conversation go without maybe telling pe people that they did it wrong or, you know, and, and how do you decide whether or not you need to create a different component as opposed to just tweaking the, the original component? Well, I think for the, for the first part, how do you just say to someone that you need to change it without saying uh, you didn't do it wrong? Um, it's something, for, at least for me, it's something I struggle like every day when I review code. How do you politely say that the code could be better without saying that? <laughs> We did, we did this wrong. Um, I think you, you just need to focus on, on the code itself. Um, mm -hmm. Ego aside uh, and just say, look, this is, if we can, we can do this uh, better because of just point reasons instead of uh, pointing uh, opinions. And I think <laughs> that that is solvable. Regarding on when you decide on to, I think when a component gets too complex, I think it was what I, I was mentioning in the beginning. I think it's time to, to break it apart. Uh, and it's not just, shouldn't be just one component anymore. How do you know when it's complex? Like what's the, what's the test for that? Well, sometimes it's just very simple things. I remember, uh, I think it was even this last week I was discussing uh, with a coworker. We have just a little tiny button that is, doesn't even look like a button, um, just an icon that, that the users click. And we, we needed to use it in a dropdown. And we were discussing if we should just make an if inside the component and say, if it's a button, render a button, or if it's a, a dropdown, render uh, an ally element with, 
with that pattern inside. And I think that's when we should break it. Uh, it shouldn't, this shouldn't be inside the component. It's just too, too complex. So when it just starts to like feel complex? Yes. <laughs> when, so I like when you look at it and you're not exactly sure like all the things that it might be doing <laughs> and yes, you exactly. really have to review it? I always like to think of them like a UI library that I just, I know that component will always render button or I know that the component will always render a drop down, not sometimes one, others the other. Mm -hmm. And oh. it, you, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say, so you've, you talked a little bit about how you need to, uh, have everyone using the same conventions, either for accessibility or for like when to break out a component. And I, I know GitLab actually has a style guide. Uh, it's actually one of the things that uh, the Vue team used to develop our own style guide for the community. So thank you very much for uh, doing so much like inspirational work for that to, to help us get a head start on it. Uh, but I was also curious uh, in terms of making those conversations easier about, you know, basically telling people how to code, like telling people, you know, when should we should break out a component, how we make things accessible. Uh, how have you, how have you done that in your style guide? I'm, I'm really curious. And what kind of challenges have you found where, well, actually we'll just go general first. So. Well, there wasn't much of the discussion with the, yeah. with the, with the style guide, because when we started doing view, so, we we uh, our we didn't start an application from the beginning, so we we um, added view on the top of on top of GitLab. And when we started, uh, we started several several coworkers at the same time. Um, so quickly uh, after we after we added view, we had different ways of doing view, and it mm -hmm. was very hard to review code. That mm. didn't mean that they were wrong; uh, they were just different ways. Uh, so I, I got a little bit tired of reviewing uh, different view in every in every page, and especially of uh, trying to fix a bug and need to adjust to a different style of code. Mm -hmm. um, so I I open a React style guides and try to apply the same rules. Um, so I wrote that little bit of, of a style guide. Uh, and some rules at some discussion, but I think we always defer to to React style guide and also to our own needs. Um, so there wasn't a lot of the, a lot of a discussion. We do have some discussion whether to apply some rules or not, um, because recently we started using the the view Aslint plugin uh, because it wasn't enough just to to have the style guide. But there are some rules that if we do enable them, <laughs> we will have so many errors that we can do it just in one iteration. Um, so there is some discussion on that. Um, sometimes it's very, very hard to do it um, in a polite way or, or even to reach a conclusion in a, in, a, in a quick amount of time. But And you are a completely distributed team, right? So all of your communication is you know, over text or video or something. So you, you sometimes can't communicate all the things that you want to communicate in person. And then you're also communicating between cultures oftentimes, right? Yes, and, and a lot of different time zones. Uh, so uh, it's often common that uh, when some of my coworkers uh, wake, uh, others are already asleep for, for a very long time. Uh, so it's, sometimes it starts to, to decide on something uh, very fast. But I think it's also... On, on the other end, it's also a good thing because what might what might seem obvious in one second, maybe it's not. Um, like three or four hours later, after you step away from the computer, ah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's also a, a big advantage. But we have this like we are always very uh, respectful of each other's opinions. So there's always a lot of debates, uh, which which I think it's also very healthy and. Um, it's the same as when you discuss um, the plans of a component with other co-worker, co -worker, you might find something you weren't seeing at the beginning. So it's the same regarding style. Do you have any rules internally or do you have any tips about how you discuss like style, like when you're coming up with a new convention that you want to follow? Well, we don't have uh, rules regarding 
discussing styles uh, specifically, but we do we do enforce that um, we we can't just go insults like no, one hundred uh, characters yeah. per line. It's a lot much better, a lot better than eighty. We just don't go insult everyone. So. Uh, so. So one tip is don't insult people. <laughs> don't don't make like objective statements where it's like, well, I think we should do like 100 per line because that's just better. Well, you know, like <laughs> and, and people, like like you are j- just passing down the commandments. <laughs> you know, I I have always have this feel, feeling that front end people are very opinionated. Um, oh, I, I think, think that's that's just people. <laughs> <laughs> I think we are a little bit more because I don't know. I don't see. Like my my backend coworkers discussing uh, style guide rules, uh, they just follow um, the style guide and that's it. Um, oh, oh, get them talking oh. about API conventions. Uh, but uh, we do like recently. Um, we we started use it, using Prettier, and we have had mm-hmm. a couple of problems man, uh, managing Prettier with Aslint. And one of the the things that we were um, Redefining with Aslint was the number of characters per line. Uh, we were using an Android, and with with Prettier, uh, we started using eighty again. And we didn't reach to a, a consensus, uh, but we we moved back to an Android again. Um, but I, I guess it's just we just find okay, so maybe it is um, okay to have this rule. Maybe it does make some difference in our codes yeah. uh, or. It does improve our life as a developer, and then we just go with it. For, for some things like 100 uh, characters per line versus 80 characters per line, uh, what I usually like to do in teams is have everybody vote on it. And then we have a rule that like, we're just going to follow whatever the vote is. And then after the vote, uh, we can't rediscuss this for another two months. But then you can have like, you can have another vote after that if you want, if you know what you want to try to convince people. But you know that that at least makes it so that everyone feels like it's it's a democratic process. That they might not agree with it, but honestly, for eighty versus a hundred, like it's not going to affect your productivity that much. Yeah, that that is a good solution. I think I will bring it up. We've tried voting, but uh, because we are. All in different places. Sometimes it's hard uh, to have everyone voting. Uh, so yeah, um, it's it's not always at one time. Sometimes we do it like like a, sometimes I'll drop something in a Slack, and then over the next twenty four hours, like we'll vote over this, so people can log in whenever there's time, or forty eight hours too. Like there's usually not a hard time constraint on it. Uh, yeah, sometimes we do vote, and we we do, like use emojis <laughs> to, mm-hmm. to vote. Um, but nice. We we have uh, we we now rely on um, Vue's Lint plugin and Prettier to handle everything because we wanted to be focused on bigger things than um, than style rules. Uh, it was it was very important at first to define just one way of doing something. When I don't think at the time there was um, any style any official style style guide for Vue or any S Lint Vue plugin. So at the time it was very important. Um, now we just we are able to focus on it, on every on 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 every other thing. I have a question. So, and this might be a little bit of a tangent, but on a distributed team like yours, where you have all these different time zones, how do you guys handle like standups, things like that? Do you guys just have we like don't, a Slack we channel? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's even better. I yes, wish I we do have one call, one weekly call with the front end team. Um, so our calls are done through Zoom. They are all recorded. And we also have a, d- a document uh, for every meeting with, where everything is written down. So if you are not able to attend, you can just uh, see it after. Do you think that uh, that's costing you at all, not having a daily stand up? No, it's so good not to have a daily stand up. <laughs> So what, what, what can be the beginning of my day cannot be the beginning of my, Even in the same time zone, um, I, I used to struggle in the office because um, for me, I would start coding about 9.30 and for other co-workers that only get to the office at 10. Um, so they would only start at 10.30. Uh, so for me, doing a st- uh, stand-up at 11 would completely break my morning for them doing a stand-up at nine would be just impossible. So 
Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. So I wanted to go back to like consensus on deciding things, but instead of like granular thinking bigger level things. So for example, um, like I, at in the application I build at work, we have modal components as well. And we've hooked up a lot of that to like Vuex stores and like we've made decisions whether or not to do that. And so I was curious, like what your process is um, in terms of figuring out at what point do you want to add Vuex? At what point, like, are you using specific state management systems and stuff like that? Well, when we started uh, using Vue, we we just followed uh, the Flux like implementation that um, that is in the official documentation. Uh, but then when we started to write bigger and more complex application, we kind of felt the need of something more. Uh, so we we added Vuex uh, to our stack, um, and we we still struggle to understand like should we? Well, uh, no, I'm saying wrong. So we we struggled a little in the beginning. So should we use Vuex here? Shouldn't we use Vuex here? But um, we have we have like uh, now a new idea that let's just use one one thing and just one single source of truth. So. We, we will use Vuex for several apps. But I think in GitLab, um, GitLab's case, it's a little bit different because we don't have one view application. We have several of them. So for, a, for every page, we have an, a view application. So it's a little different case by case. Uh, when we started uh, using Vuex, we also had to write a bunch of documentation on how to do it. Uh, so I, I think that was what you, you were asking. Um, so we often uh, discover that we need documentation when we get like two applications doing two different things in our code base, and then we just get together, uh, open an issue, and the, the next step, we just discuss it a little on the issue, we open a, a merge request. Sometimes we discuss it a little bit further in the merge request, um, and when we reach a consensus between, usually um, the we have like a maintainer role, which are the, the people that are allowed to, to merge into master. So usually the discussion uh, happens within the maintainers, but we also uh, pull a lot of um, a lot of other people from the team to discuss it. And when we, we get to a good conclusion, we, we merge into the documentation and everyone uses, everyone follows the documentation. That's cool. That's awesome. Um, yeah, because I found that like, I have the same issues as well in terms of at what point do I want to use Vuex because sometimes Vuex can be overload specifically for like if my application only has one modal component and like you're never ever going to be opening more than one. So there's no reason for why you should hook it up to Vuex or so on. Um, but the other thing that is also like that I also think about is when you hook Vuex into a component, it limits its reusability because then now it's like fixed to a specific use case. Is that something that you guys also like talk through as you're working through? Like, how do you maintain like uh, simplification and then reusability and like prevent yeah, any so backlinks? I also struggle like when 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 should my component stop knowing about the store about yeah. UX? So sometimes it's hard um, to to draw a line that. From here to like every new component, and every child component, 
uh, from this point should not know about Vuex. Yeah, sometimes it's hard. I think it's it's easier with small components. Uh, components. Um, in our case, our models don't know about the store. Um, they just receive properties uh, in order to reuse them within every application. I think exactly because not all of our applications have Vuex. Um, and because we have so many different applications, they just receive properties. Yeah, I think that goes back to you, what you were saying earlier with uh, taking your components and refactoring them into more components and you have these nested components. So you have to make the decision, you know, do, where do I, do I use props and then events to bring the information back and then use the, the store in the component or does the, do the, the child components actually have the store in them? So I, I think there's probably some design decisions in that too. Yeah, and it's it's just it's so easy to use small components with UX because you don't need to uh, keep bubbling events up. You just you have everything you need there. <laughs> but at, at at the same time, you won't be able to reuse them elsewhere. We we have this um, pipeline stable when you can see all the pipelines uh, of your project, and it's it's built with um, just. It's a flux-like implementation. It doesn't use Vuex. And every little table cell that, that allows you to click on it, it just it bubbles up an event, and it has to warn the main component. Um, look, I clicked on it, so you need to refresh the whole table, but the whole table is pulling, so you need to stop pulling. And I've looked at it so many times and thought, let's make this Vuex so I don't have to just bubble up all the events, just say to the store, stop pulling, now pull again. Uh, so I, I can relate to that problem. Would you say that that's generally a sign that you want to start using Vuex when you are passing down a bunch of props in a long chain of nested child components and then you're yes. bubbling up a bunch of events and then, and then passing it to siblings? Yes, we, kinda, we actually uh, came up with a solution to not have to bubbling up uh, the... Um, the events like for every component because we thought we, if we move this component we will break it if we add just one more layer and we forget to bubble up the event again mm -hmm. we will break everything so we just use a new view instance to just we just use it like an event hub and but we are only allowed to use that view instance within those components um, so do you do you store state on the root and then access this dot dollar sign root no, no, we just we just have like a new view empty instance that we just use like an event hub that oh, got it. transports uh, things from, from one way to the other. Got it. Like an event bus. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it can be dangerous though. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it can be difficult to debug because it's hard to figure out where state changes are coming from. Yes, exactly. Uh, which is why we, we figured out that UX is, is a lot better um, in the we. If we are building a new view application, we are, if we are starting a new feature, we should be using Vuex. So something that I'm kind of curious about, or related to either state management or, or any part of building view applications, are there parts of the official view style guide that GitLab has chosen not to follow because uh, they, they found that a slightly different convention works better for them? This is a very selfish question that I'm asking because I'm, I'm also curious about how we can further improve the style guide. No, I don't think so. We actually um, already deleted some of our style guide in order to defer to the official one. I think we we left a few things there uh, because I'm not sure if it's because it's not on the on the style guides or if there are a few things that they are. We have so many um, so many codes, so much code already using it that. Just we we'll leave it there for now. Mm -hmm. But I yeah. don't think there's something that we actively. I think that's a good reason. Different. Is there anything that you're doing that isn't in the style guide, like a convention that you found that's really helpful for you and your team that people might want to know about? And maybe we should add it to the style guide. That's a good question. I'm trying to think of it. Um, I don't. I don't think there is. There is any rule that we, yeah, I don't think, I don't think we do have, um, even, I think even small rules like the naming convention, uh, we, we used to have, um, 
we 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 refactor it to match the official style guide, style guide. I think we are following it one hundred percent for now. Yeah. I think the style guide should force you to put a comment in every component file that says how awesome views on view is. <laughs> we can we can add that. I can commit that right now. <laughs> I'll pay you later. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'd like to have uh, Chris uh, audit their code base to see if it's 100% following the style guide. Does every V4 have a key on it? Yeah, stuff like that. You know, I, I doubt I doubt any of my code bases 100% follow the style guide. So I, I can I can forgive them if they don't. No, you you really have to go after them if they don't. That would qualify you to be a politician. Oh yeah, we need an automated tool. <laughs> yeah, somebody write somebody write that. That I actually agree with. I really like the static analysis tools that do the style evaluation and say, hey, you missed this, you missed that. Like, like he has lent in prettier? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and Vue has... Uh, I, uh, Philip, I might have mentioned it earlier, but uh, Vue has an official ESLint plugin that catches a lot of things that are in the style guide. And the rules are even categorized into the, the same categories that are in the style guide. So you can choose that, okay, I just want to apply rules that will catch potential errors, or you know, I, I want to be a little bit more opinionated and do the strongly recommended rules or just the recommended rules where like, you know, I, there are so many things that you could do and you just have to pick one to be consistent. Vue CLI 3 also has the ability for you to um, configure whether like which style guide you want. So when you use Vue CLI 3, you can choose whether you want like the weak ESLint, which gives you warnings, or there's like the opposite spectrum, with it, which is strong, which also gives you recommendations on like the order in which you write your, the order in which you place like methods and data and so on, which like it actually, <laughs> like instead of warnings, it tells you you have errors in your terminal, or whatever you use to run your code. So like if you use CLI, it gives you that out of the box so you don't have to configure it yourself if you so choose, which is awesome. Yeah, that's Vue CLI 3, the, the beta, but the, the beta is really good. Uh, it's, it's not complete yet, and there are still some breaking changes that we could make, but I'm already w using it for like a couple production apps. Mm -hmm. I think it would be really great if it gave you like a grade on a scale from Chuck to Chris on how well you're following the style guide. W which one's high and which one's low? <laughs> you get to decide. <laughs> Chuck is low, but Chuck is cool. <laughs> Well, oh, I have to say that um, the the Vue Eslint plugin uh, saved us so much time because we I think we only edited it in January, um, but in every little review we 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 did uh, checking every room manually um, <laughs> it was very painful. So we are very thankful for Eslint plugin. Yeah, and shout out to the maintainers. Um of the ESLint plugin who have done a, a lot, a lot of work. Like I've, I've done some work and, and some like big picture stuff, but I'm mostly like an advisor for that library. And, and they do a lot of the heavy lifting, like making a, a lot of rules that uh, usually like aren't even possible with other ESLint plugins. They've done some really impressive work. So to definitely go and check it out and, and look at the contributors list. There's some, some people who have done some really fantastic work. And they are very responsive. Um, I haven't contributed much, but every time I go there, um, we always get an answer. Uh, so it's it's awesome. Yeah, they're very friendly for like a, a library that you know talks about enforcing style, yes. telling you how to write code. <laughs> that's right. You use three spaces. That's bad. Well, view view personally like or our view on view is it, we don't care how many spaces you use because Vue is going to work either way. So it, you could use three and you'd be wrong, but, but you totally can. And, and we don't have an opinion on it. <laughs> nice. We don't have an opinion on how wrong you are. No, no I'm just kidding. I, I have my personal preferences, but... Five, right? It's five. Oh, it's, it's two. <laughs> We we could we could talk about this in a little bit more detail, but like from from the research that's been done, I don't know. Like two seems to be the best style. Uh, like 
it's it, yeah it seems pretty definitive but we can we i, I don't want to go too much into it but anyway anyway <laughs> it's not it's not like your code base is going to fall apart if you're using five or you're using three or you're using four or whatever if you're using eight come on get your life together but uh other than that i used eight <laughs> 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 yeah, I think, I think that's a really nice thing, though, you know, back to your point of we're all going to vote on this and we're going to do it for two months and then we can talk about it, is that all of this can change, right? It, it, it all depends on the team, um, how you approach the reusability, how you approach accessibility, how you approach your process for choosing what you're going to work on and how you write your code. I mean, some teams really thrive under some circumstances that other teams would really, really not do well under. And so, yeah, you can make that determination on your own. Yeah. Yeah, and everyone brings different experiences, different preferences, different workflows. Yep. If you're on a 4K monitor, you might be able to get by with eight spaces. That could work out. <laughs> you're going to need more than 100 lines uh, or 100 characters per line. <laughs> yeah. 80, 80. Uh, maybe 100. Oh. <laughs> Back to our original topic, uh, Philippa, what, what prompted you to write this blog post in the first place? Like what, what were you working on and how did you see that this would help other people? Uh, so I'm, I'm contributing with Alligator on um, writing some content to help people um, learn, learn uh, view. Um, and this was uh, one of the topics we, we were discussing. Um, I, I have to confess that personally, uh, I'm not a fan of models. If I can avoid them, I will. <laughs> uh, but it, they are actually very hard uh, to make or, or to make reusable. I think um, even even the I think even the, the, the article I wrote it won't it won't work for every single application or for every single need because, uh, for example, at GitLab uh, we also have. Um, a model, um, and because our style uh, and our our application uses Bootstrap, um, we need to basically we need to create a view component that it will render exactly the same as Bootstrap. So, for example, that the, the article I wrote uh, doesn't apply for GitLab. Um, so, I think what I I think the main focus of that article was to just give a simple way of, or at least giving people the tools um, to create uh, a component that's reusable, but you can actually um, tweak it for your, for your own, own use. When you wrote this, did you use the same basic, uh, I'm going to call it like, not just styles, but like CSS strategy for the modal that uh, Bootstrap does? Did you kind of just extract what they were doing? Uh, no, not really. I actually um, tried to, Avoid it a little. Just I, I, I when I try to write a, uh, these articles, what I think is what is my understanding of this component. So for me, a model it's just a, a div that um, has like a, a, a backdrop uh, on the ground on the, on the background. Um, so that was what I was trying to follow. In. And then uh, for me, a model also has like a, you have an header and um, a body and, and a footer, and you can just dismiss it. Um, so I, I tried to follow that. Um, and well, at the same time, I had to think, okay, so this is this isn't just for me. So <laughs> let's style it a bit. But I don't think I tried to to follow, or I tried to not to focus much on on Bootstrap styling. So you did have to replicate some of the Bootstrap like look and feel, but you didn't replicate how Bootstrap actually handles modals. Yes, exactly. Gotcha. Whenever I do a modal, I just wrap Bootstrap. And whatever framework I'm using, <laughs> that's my strategy. That's yeah, I, I think I think if you're like writing a, a very big application, you probably you you already be using um, an external library to handle all this all these things for you. So there's no need for you to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I agree. And there are component UI libraries like ViewStrap for Bootstrap and Beautify is another big one that uh, a lot of people in the community really, really love. Do you and guys there, use there that as well. Uh, I'm sorry? Do you guys use that at GitLab? Anything other than Bootstrap? No. Uh, so because our 
main base is uh, our Rails application. Uh, we we did we do use Bootstrap uh, and with a lot of jQuery. So when we started uh, building applications with Vue, um, I think it was more than a year and a half ago. Um, our first approach was trying to test if Vue would fit our needs. So we didn't really focus on choosing a library. Um, so Vue quickly fit our needs. Uh, we see, okay, this is great. Let's use it. Uh, our Vue code base grew a lot very fast. And now we have the need to have a UI library because we we repeat components a lot and we shouldn't be uh, doing that. So we are discussing on, on now how we could do a view library. Um, should we implement everything from, from scratch? Should we use anything? So it, we are trying to understand which uh, view library would um, match our, our, our needs because especially we, we need to keep the old bootstrap version, but we need to make them look the same. So the, the end user shouldn't know that if he's in a page that was built with Vue or with Rails. Uh, so it's a little bit tricky. Yay, Rails! <laughs> I get crap on JavaScript Jabber for being a Ruby guy. <laughs> I, I actually started with Ruby uh, once upon a time. That was my, my first foray into web development. Nice. All right. Well, anything else we should jump into before we do picks? I actually had something I wanted to talk about. Okay. Like, so um, I've seen people use like in the React community, they have um, this concept of portals. I mean, personally, I don't see the. So sometimes when you have like a modal, you want like a modal to update content in the background. Like if I don't know if there's an incremental and you want to increment the background. Um, uh, portals is just a way for your modal to speak back to your parent element, I guess, or like the, the other DOM that it's unrelated to, um, which is like different from passing props because the modal is separate from the other components. Um, and I've seen implementations of that. I think uh, Linus Borg and uh, Thorsten, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. he created a plugin called View Portal, which I think is really cool. Uh, and I haven't had time to play around with it, but I was curious if anyone else has. Yeah, it, it is pretty cool. I, I've used it in one application. Uh, I've used Ember in, in a different framework. I've used something called Wormhole. Um, but yeah, it's similar. Concept. Wormholes are similar to portals? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> in real life. Too. But yeah, I would recommend people check that out because it's a it's a neat way of doing it. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel like like Filippo was saying, because um, it's a it, it's like plug and playable. So you can get the functionality of a portal without having to build a or a wormhole, whatever you call it. But mm -hmm. or a teleport path or, or a teleport path. <laughs> but uh, I think I, <laughs> I think in Vue we call them portals, and I think React does too. So yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Well, let's go ahead and do some picks. Eric, do you want to start us off with picks? For you, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at LootCrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings... Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I just have two quick ones. A uh, couple shows I've been watching. One is called Deception. It's on ABC. It's kind of a funny show about a, a magician who ends up uh, solving crime. So they, it's kind of a weird concept, but it works. So it's, it's about this magician that, uh, that helps like the FBI solve crime. And then, you know, I've been watching Roseanne which I think everybody knows about that came back a few weeks ago. So I like the, a little bit of political commentary in there, but not too much, but kind of the old Roseanne that everybody liked in, in the eighties um, is back and 
and recommend people watching that. All right. Uh, Divya, do you want to give us some picks? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll have to link this in the show notes, but there was an article that was released about proxies, which I think are awesome, especially because um, Vue is moving its reactivity system into pro- into using proxies. So I think it's like useful to just understand what that means under the hood, just to, just to get a concept of what what proxies are. So that's like one of the picks because I think this article was in was written at the end of March and it was in the Pony Fu newsletter. So that's my first pick. My second pick is the second book to Three Body Problem, which I think uh, Chris has plugged before. Uh, and I would say that the first book was great. The second book, the translator is different. And so there's a lot of extra detail into it. But I think the story and the plot is still extremely compelling. So I'd recommend reading that. If you've read the first one and you would like to continue, I would recommend it. Um, and then the second one, or the last pick would be, I know this is a view podcast, but um, I still do a lot of React development. And <laughs> I think, so I think Brian Vaughn and like the React team released 16.3 a couple of weeks ago. And they reached out to the community yesterday or sometime this week about how people were feeling about the specific features that they had released. And some comments were that like forward refs were not very clear. And so as a result of that comment, they released like extra documentation, which I think is like, it's pretty well explained. And it's a great, it's a great response, I think, um, from a core team in relation to like the community, because it shows that there is some sense of like wanting to make sure people understand concepts and features, which, which I think is wonderful. So that's mine. Chris, what are your picks? Okay. So my first pick is going to be The Fifth Season, which is a book that I'm reading now by N.K. Jemison, which is sort of a, a fantasy slash sci-fi. I'm not exactly sure uh, where to categorize it, but I'm really enjoying it so far. Uh, highly recommend checking it out. I, I don't want to say too much about it, uh, except that you might find it earth-shattering. Uh, that, that, that you'll get it once you read it. So, and then my next pick is a podcast called Flash Forward, which is about potential futures. And the last season of Flash Forward is really, really good. Uh, it's been my favorite season so far. I definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, Gray Dawn was personally my favorite. And then I also want to talk about uh, View CLI 3's UI, which is being developed by Acrium uh, on GitHub, and his real name is Guillaume. And it's like, basically, he's doing so much fantastic work on it. It's basically like an operating system for like a view app that <laughs> gives you like all the possible information that you might want to know, and uh, gives you the ability to do things like install plugins, like directly from a beautiful, beautiful interface. I'm so, so excited about this. I think it's going to totally spoil anyone who's building view apps uh, once that's finally released. It's in a feature branch right now. And those are all my tips. Nice. Joe, do you want to give us some picks and an update on the Framework Summit if there's anything new? Cool. Um, Yeah, so for my picks, I read a really interesting article called Exploring Zero Configuration with View. And I thought that was really cool. The author goes through the various ways to set up a view project and then explores how close you can get to zero configuration. It even talks about uh, the CLI version 3, and which is brings official zero configuration support for view and talks about sort of this, you know, subjective view on how zero configuration it actually is. Great article, very well written, uh, done by Wrangle. So... Uh, Fantastic article. Highly recommend it. So that's going to be uh, my pick uh, for the Framework Summit. Other than we have bet, we have added some more speakers, Asim Hussain, Simona Coton. Um, man, there was one more. I can't remember. But mostly right now, it's just in a holding pattern until the CFP opens up at the, um, in, in the, I think the beginning of May is when the CFP opens up. So that's it for the framework summit. Cool. Well, this should come out around the beginning of May. So if you've 
and thinking about submitting. Uh, what kinds of talks are you looking for, Joe? Yeah, so stuff on Vue and stuff on multiple frameworks. So if uh, you have ideas about content that can apply to more than just one front-end framework, that's the ideal piece of content is things that help people learn more than just a single framework at a time. Although uh, we do have, uh, we are looking for content that is specific to a, a given framework as well. And if you are lucky enough to submit an amazing talk and get accepted, you will have the fantastic opportunity to meet Chris Fritz in person because he will be there representing the official representative of the Vue Vue framework, giving a keynote talk. And you'll be very disappointed uh, when you meet me. (laughs) But the good news is there's a lot of other really, really great speakers uh, and other really cool people from the community. Yeah. So um, speaking of which, I actually want to add one more pick. Uh, as we were talking about Chris, I was watching one of his his talk from, uh, dang, I can't remember where the conference was. Uh, the Seven Secret Patterns View Consultants Don't Want You to Know. What, what, what conference was that from? I first gave that at Spotlight, and then I gave another version of it at ViewConf with yeah. a couple of the tips switched out. <laughs> Keep it fresh. So it was a really good, I, I, would, I would think a lot of people might have already seen it, but if you have not seen that uh, talk, great talk. Highly recommend it. So yeah, it's on YouTube. You can find it. Yeah, easy to find on YouTube. Sorry for the clickbait title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice clickbait title. I, I do try to own it. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, I'll jump in here with a couple of picks. Um, I have been starting to play with a couple of things that I'm kind of excited about, and this is a JavaScript uh, related podcast. And so I'm going to pick another framework. Um, I've been playing with the Stimulus framework. Um, it's a, kind of a minim, minimalist framework. Um, it was written by the folks over at Basecamp. Rails has been brought up a few times. Um, and we've had uh, David Heinemeyer Hansen or DHH on Ruby Rogues, and he's talked a bit about it. So um, anyway, it's just nice. Uh, the idea of JavaScript sprinkles is what he calls them in your app. I'm, I'm digging it. Um, I think all of these tools have a place, so I'm, I'm not advocating that anybody replace Vue or React or anything with it, but it's definitely something to look at. Uh, the other... Th- what? JavaScript sprinkles. That's sticky. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I had come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's like a cupcake. No, he didn't say that. Anyway, um, the other thing that I, uh, I've been playing with a little bit is Ethereum um, and blockchain. And that's been kind of an interesting mind bend. Um, I submitted a talk to speak at Ruby Hack, which is at the beginning of May in Salt Lake City, um, to talk about Ruby and blockchain. And so this is one of the ways I've been digging into it. And it's, it's cool tech. So if you're looking into that, I will also then pick um, the Udemy course on blockchain and Ethereum. It's pretty darn good. When's the blockchain podcast coming out? You know, I've had a few people ask about it. Um, I have a few others that people have been um, actually willing to do the work to get together. So I've been working on those. Um, we're releasing an Elixir podcast. F- episode one is being recorded next week. And I told them I'd be in and out because I'm doing interviews at NGComp. Um, and then uh, one of my other co-hosts on Ruby Rogues, um, we've pretty much finalized on getting stuff together for a data science podcast. So those are the ones that we're working on now. Um, and then, like I said, I'm working on the um, flash briefing type podcast slash YouTube show slash, uh, you know, whatever um, that are really short. And that those are going to cover um, Ruby, JavaScript, and Angular since those are the shows that I have established right now. And um, depending on how this show and the React show go and how many people I think I can reach with them because I want to do things that impact as many people as possible then I may start uh, shorts on, on those as well. So we'll see. But anyway, you asked, so there's your answer. But yeah, I have, I've had a few people talk to me about blockchain podcast, but nobody's w- willing to do the work to find the host and the guests yet, and I don't have time to do it. So there you go. All right, Philippa, what are your picks? 
I would like to mention uh, this podcast is called uh, Remote Work, um, and you can literally learn everything about remote work, and it's run by our VP of product, uh, which is, I think I will say his name his name um, wrong, but it's Jörg van der Hoot. Um, and it's, it's very interesting because it uh, discusses things like very like uh, managing your um, work-life balances. And um, it also, one of the episodes comes with uh, one of our designers and our uh, a design position. Um, it's a lot, requires, usually requires a lot more interaction with your peers to, to, to define a, a UX. And it's, it's very interesting to, to hear um, their opinions on, on remote work. That sounds great. We should probably, I'd love to get an introduction and see if we can collaborate podcast wise so i will do that awesome uh one last thing if people want to see what you're working on or you know thinking about or things like that um where should they follow you twitter github blog more than that well um (laughs) the place where you'll see me uh, more active is gitlab uh so you can i think it's uh, gitlab slash philippa um You'll find me there, but on Twitter as well. Um, if you go to GitHub, you'll probably just see um, my GitLab's contributions. But uh, you can also uh, follow some content I write on uh, alligator.io. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you, Filippa, for coming. And thank you for the, the blogging and the ideas that you put out there for us. Thank you for having me. All right. We'll be back next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.